Faces are the most important aspects of our identity. The human brain is hardwired to recognise every nuance of every expression. I'm really bad at recognising faces. I can meet someone at a party and have quite a long chat with them and then meet them again maybe six months later and have no idea who they are. I work in a computer science department. There are lots of processing programs, powerful computers, lots of devices around me, like my camera, that can pick up a face and track it. So is the human brain superior to a computer? Or is it actually something that's really hard to achieve and, and actually my brain is doing something exceptionally clever? We just spend a lot of our time looking at faces and we read a lot of different kinds of information from them. Information that's socially important to us. So if we look at a face we can straight away tell is this someone who's male or female, are they young or old, is it someone we know. Um, we can tell a lot about their internal mental state, we can make inferences about their mood based on their facial expression. We can also make guesses about their interests and their goals in the immediate environment based on where they're looking. But interpreting faces is harder than you might think, as researchers at the Harriet Watt Robot Lab have discovered. Hi there. Hello, I am Sarah. Hi Sarah, nice to meet you. Hello, Hi. I'm Michael. Hi, Hi. Michael. Hello. And you Amal. must be Amal. Hi, Hi. Amal, nice to meet you. Tell me a little bit about Sarah. Sarah is a social agent robot to aid you. Michael and Amal are working on Sarah, who is able to spot faces and engage with them. This software is not doing face recognition, it's doing face tracking. So it can find a face in the environment and Sarah can use this information to look at the person. Can we produce something which behaves in a sufficiently social and intelligent way to not to be human, but to fit into a human environment. We know from trying to build robots how far short we are of living things. So let's put it very bluntly, the best robot that you come across is less effective than a slug. Little squishy thing, you might not think of as being an intelligent animal. It lives in an environment, it multiplies. Could a robot do that? I think not. Sarah's face tracking ability has taken years to develop. But for humans, this is an instinctive response. Faces can capture our attention more than other things do. You go into a room and there's someone in there, the first thing you orient to is that person's face. So you, you probably have the experience that if you look up at uh, clouds or if you are looking at a pattern in a rug or a curtain or something, you can sometimes see a face pattern emerging. Yeah. And it's as if faces are so important to us that we don't want to miss one. So you'd rather see a few faces where there aren't any than <laughs> miss faces where there are. Okay. Once we've seen a face several times, most of us are able to quickly identify it. But imagine if you couldn't recognise anyone. David Fine suffers from a condition known as prosopagnosia or face blindness. Because I can't um, identify individuals, then what I'm doing is looking at a face in a very analytical way. So I'm saying, how busy is her, his nose? Okay. How prominent is her chin? And I'm trying to put it together. And then sometimes there are additional features. Ah, I know that that's my friend because I recognize her pearl earrings. Um, but I have, for instance, followed the wrong uh, person around an airport, um, okay. you know, thinking that you know, she was ahead of me and then suddenly I found myself in the wrong queue for the wrong plane behind the wrong woman. <laughs> Everyone except people like me has a facial uh, recognition centre and that's quite clearly defined on things like functional MRI. In people like myself, this is damaged in some way. How far do you think we are from Sarah being able to achieve face recognition? Face recognition under the circumstances we're talking about is very difficult. And this robots moving around, it won't be at the same distance from anybody, the lighting conditions in the lab vary wildly depending on whether it's sunny or not. One of my colleagues might grow a beard for instance. <laughs> right. So we're looking for other ways of knowing who we're talking to in the short term while face recognition improves. For instance, Sarah knows whose desks are in there and who's likely to be sitting at them. 
So that sounds like a big challenge, and yet this is something that we can do without having to think about it. So maybe the answer lies somewhere within our brain. Harry Griffin explained to me one of the current theories in psychology on face recognition called face space. Face space is one conceptual framework of the way that our brain might organise visual information about faces. Um, so the idea is that you have a number of dimensions on which you can describe faces. You might, uh, for example, have a dimension that codes for uh, big eyes versus uh, small eyes, uh, and a dimension that codes for a long nose versus a, a, a short nose, and it's been in the third dimension here. A very round face um, compared to a very long face. Any face, once you've got enough of these dimensions, can be described uh, as a point somewhere in this multidimensional space. Mm -hmm. On any of these dimensions, faces will be much more um, densely clustered around the middle. So you have lots and lots of faces uh, around the middle, because most faces have fairly average length noses. One way you might code information in face space is as a difference from this norm. So let's go back to our original face here. If this, um, oh, I draw a straight line. Um, uh, if you describe this face as a, as a difference from the norm, that might be quite an efficient way of coding um, information about a face, because rather than coding for every single face, you simply um, code for your norm, and you code for what the different dimensions are, and then you can represent the, the, uh, the face within the space. Some robot designers are using the idea of face space to train computers to plot faces on grids like this, but it's early days. Our relationship with other people's faces is even deeper and more complex. John Walton, a world-class portrait painter, spends a long time studying his subject's faces. When I'm painting you, you will stand behind and look at the painting I'm doing of you, and you will determine whether I'm doing what you want. Are you painting what you think the person wants, though, or are you or, painting uh, no, what, I'll tell you, what I'll, you represent? I'll tell, I'll tell you one other thing. Just let me explain. What will happen is, you will say, I don't think it looks like you. So what I shall tell you to do, because your face isn't symmetrical, mm -hmm. one eye's higher than the other. I noticed that immediately, that one's higher than that one. Who's right? getting glasses? I don't. Right? So, <laughs> so what I would do is make you look at your portrait in a hand mirror, mm -hmm. because the person you know is back to front. People tend to judge faces more by one side than the other. So you tend to judge people more on the right-hand side of their face. Um, and this has been shown by creating images where you duplicate the, the right-hand side of their face. You mirror I've done image that. onto them. You've done, done this. As a child, we cut the negatives in half and printed the left side of our face together, oh. one turning the negative up, and then we turned, did two right-hand sides of our yeah. face. So we got two different people. What people have um, found from this is that one, one of those images will look very much like you, and the other one will look surprisingly unlike you, because we, we have this bias. Symmetry, apparently, is the ultimate sense of beauty. The more symmetrical your face is, the more beautiful. So if I was painting you and you weren't quite symmetrical, I would just shift it up very craftily. Beauty seems to be symmetrical and perfect. One of the oddities of this is that the better looking you are, the more difficult you are to recognise. The fashion for people to have their teeth straightened makes life much more difficult for me. When uh, people uh, often had crooked teeth and things, then that made it easier for me uh, to identify them. My wife pointed out to me that actually I shouldn't tell people that because inevitably when I say, ah, it's easy to recognise you because of your nose, they're aware that they've got a big bent nose and that's the last thing they want to hear from you. As someone gets older, they get less symmetrical and that's particularly true of males. Yes. Uh, is that something that uh, you're conscious of when you're, when you're painting someone? I think so. And I think one of the things I like with small children, I, I, I paint children as well, mm. is they have symmetrical smiles. Mm -hmm. Both sides of the mouth go up together. An adult, you always get a twist, one side of the mouth or the other. When they smile, yours is on that side, for instance, you mm -hmm. see. With a child, they get a beam and it goes straight across horizontally. That's very nice mm -hmm. if you get a child smiling. Do you know why that is? Is there a medical or a physiological reason why smiles change as we age? Or? The face is more expressive on one side than the other, mm. uh, which has to do with um, the, the wiring of the brain and uh, the, the contralateral projections from the muscles to the uh, cerebral hemispheres. So uh, everything that's controlled on this side of my body is controlled by this side of the brain mm. and, and vice versa. The way emotions are processed in the brain is, is not symmetrical, so there's more activity on one side than, than the other, and that causes 
emotional expressions to be stronger on the opposite side. But the thinking is, as you go through life, that's been true for longer, and so the, the, the musculature is, is more wonky, if you like, because it's been used to differing degrees. A well-known expression is that the eyes are the window to the soul, and our faces give very important clues to how we're feeling and our emotions. But our faces are also moving all the time as we talk and we move around. So how could a computer track our animated faces and be able to identify our emotions so that they can work out how best to respond to us socially? When we uh, try to recognise uh, the user's emotions, uh, uh, we're looking at cues such as uh, the user smiles, the eye gaze. Uh, so we're looking at uh, uh, how face and facial expressions can convey something about what the users might actually feel. The very first step is to use some algorithms to track specific points in the face. For example, we identify points in the lips and then we try to analyze them to see whether they could be associated with an expression of smile. So the idea is to collect a lot of examples of faces so that the computer can learn to process uh, what can be a smile or what instead is a neutral expression. There's something very deep and straightforward and intuitive about a facial expression. So if Sarah carries out a task successfully, she looks happy and the expression is tailored so that you know she looks happy. She has a couple of emotions that she can express, obviously not quite as big a range as a human being because mm -hmm. of the kind of simple geometry of her head. There we go. That's Joy, so we've got a kind of slightly uh, open mouth and tilted eyebrows. She has acquired a personality, which is interesting. What's your favourite bit about Sarah? What do you like most about her? You can produce all kinds of interesting expressions, slightly cartoony, um, okay. deliberately. We don't want it to look too much like a human. Anger is also a good one, and I think it's very, very <laughs> universally understood. Um, and maybe another really good one is surprise. We can really make use of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. eyes being able to move out of the head. Where do you think computers are versus how our brain can manage recognising faces? Well, it's certainly an enormous challenge for, for computers to achieve what our brain achieves. Because, as you say, we're, um, there are layers and layers of processing of which we're not aware. All that pops out of us at the end is that that is Sam's face. Computers have to go through all the stages of discounting so much irrelevant information, for example, the particular expression on your face, they need to get rid of that just to uh, abstract down to the fact that it is just your face. <laughs> there are still lots of mysteries about face recognition left to study, so it's an exciting time. Maybe in the future, social robots will be able to read all they need to know from your face. And yet we're still going to be a long way from what your brain is able to do right now. Bye Sarah, we're leaving now. Bye bye. Night night. <laughs>